There is an old saying in Oklahoma that be, behind a good Cambodian, there's a great Texan. <laughs> and that's my wife, Martha. She's from Pampa, Texas. If you don't know, do not know where it is, it's about 60 miles northeast of Amarillo. You don't go there unless you have to. <laughs> and they say there's nothing between Pampa and the North Pole except a barbed wire fence and two strands are down. Uh, this is a very special occasion. I think it's, uh, the time is, is very good because it happened after the Cambodian New Year which was celebrated uh, about 10 days ago on April 13, which happened to be my mother's birthday and also Thomas Jefferson's birthday. And then next week, we'll have the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, through which uh, George H.W. Bush was the first president to extend the weekly celebration to one month. I'm very happy to be here with with my wife Martha to take you on a little journey back in time, uh, about 50 years, and in space uh, to the other side of the world. Many of you have been to my country of birth, and when you go there, you probably remember that if it's, it's moving, it's not moving, it is. Oh, it's, I just turned it off. What happened? Okay, here we go. If you go to Cambodia, you'll land at my village at Po Chen Tong, because I was born less than, a, less than a mile from this terminal. Cambodia was still under the French rule, and everything that was a symbol of the outside world was France, France, and France, until 1953, when the Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon and Mrs. Nixon, came to visit. Then our teachers told us that there was another country, bigger and farther away than France, it's called United States of America. My father was a police chief uh, and uh, she passed away when I was nine years old. And my mother worked very hard to bring me up. Uh, she told me since I was a child to never give up hope, no matter what happens. That was instilled in me since my childhood. She worked very hard. At one point, she had to sell lotus leaves which were used to wrap to produce because in the 50s in uh, poor countries like Cambodia, people went to the market every day to buy fresh produce and those were wrapped in lotus leaves. She, she sent me to the best school in the kingdom uh, called Sisovat, which was like the handover of Cambodia. And in 1969, after I finished high school, I went to work for an airline. I traveled all over Asia. I went to China in 1969, at the peak of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I uh, never saw what, I never thought that what I saw in China would be coming to my homeland uh, a few years later. But one of, my, one of my claims to fame is that I've been to China three years before Nixon and Kissinger. In 1975, uh, the war in Vietnam and Cambodia was coming to an end. Uh, two years earlier, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese that occupied the eastern part of Cambodia broke out of their sanctuaries and began to attack the Cambodian government forces, which were very well, very, very ill-equipped and ill-trained. Uh, the United States supported the uh, Lonel government. On April 10, 1975, President Ford gave an address to the Joint Session of Congress in this picture. He said for this administration, the time is very short and the options are very few as far as Cambodia and South Vietnam are concerned. When I heard that, my heart sank because I knew the United States was going to pull out and Cambodia and South Vietnam would just fall apart. Two days later, on April 12, I was working at that time for CARE, a relief organization that helped uh, many hundreds of thousands of refugees that fled the war-torn countryside to seek 
shelter and safety in the, in the cities and in the capital. Uh, at one point, we were helping half a million refugees. We were told, I was told by a U.S. Embassy official that I must be at the embassy within one hour if I wanted to be airlifted out of Cambodia. I had a meeting with the governor of a province uh, that morning, and I thought that by going to the meeting, I would be able to save the lives of some 3,000 refugee families who had been stranded in that province after the road had been cut by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and later on by the Khmer Rouge. When I arrived at the embassy, I was told that the last helicopter had taken off 30 minutes before, so I missed the U.S. evacuation by 30 minutes. Five days later, the Khmer Rouge came in and they turned the country upside down. I saw many Cambodians here and most of us. I think if you talk to a Cambodian, there's not one whose life has not been affected by the Khmer Rouge rule. Each of us has lost something and someone dearest. They turned the country upside down. They started killing anybody who wore glasses because that's a sign of being educated. They killed teachers, nurses, uh, business people, government officials, anybody who had not been with them during the so-called revolution. My mother knew I was in danger because I was the first to go to college. I spoke French, I spoke English. I worked for an American organization. These are all the, unfortunately, the qualifications uh, to be eliminated by the Khmer Rouge. So she gave me her wedding ring, a scarf, a scarf, an empty a bag of rice, and she told me to run. No matter what happens, never give up hope. So I picked an old bicycle, I rode the bike, for three weeks crossing Cambodia from the southeastern part all the way to the northwestern part. I used fake passes and false excuses to get through the Khmer checkpoints. I was captured near the Thai border and they tied my arms behind my back and they were, they were going to kill me because they suspected that I was trying to cross the border to Thailand, which was actually my intention. But a truck driver whom I had met a few days before, he saved my life. He said that I, I was an innocent person traveling around looking for my family. So for the next year, I was put in forced labor camp. We were put to work 18 hours a day. We were given a bowl of rancid soup a day. At night when I went to sleep, I never knew if I would be alive the following morning. When I woke up, I said I would make it to Thailand and to freedom. Sometime in January, they were looking for a crane operator. I knew the crane would, the job would take me closer to Thailand because they were going to use a crane to pick up timber, teak, that was found along the Thai border. And that, that would increase my chance to escape. So I raised my hand, I said I was a, tra a crane operator. I never been in a crane in my life. So what I did was to burn small candles, I pull a blanket over my head, and I began to study the instructions. That fact alone that it cost me the life if I was caught reading. Not just reading, but reading something in English. But I took the chance. Now the logging truck, it looks something like this. It's, uh, we put the lock on the truck and then we drove back into the nearest town called Sisupon. Uh, during the subsequent trips to the border, I was able to study the land area and I found out that the shortest distance to Thailand was somewhere between the timber pickup point and the nurse village. So on February the 13th, 1976, I was alone at the back of the timber truck. But I couldn't have jumped to the left because the driver would have seen me. 
I could not jump to the right. A Khmer soldier with an AK-47 would have seen me. So what I did, I crawl from the front all the way to the back and just drop myself behind the truck. You can see this is very, this is very high. So when I dropped myself behind the truck, I was caught in a piece of lumber. And I was dragged for a few hundred yards before I was flung off when the truck went over a rock. I picked myself up and I began to run, to crawl, to walk, to swim for three days, having nothing to eat or to drink. I fell in a booby trap, which is a deep hole full of punchy sticks, sharp bamboo sticks. It was supposed to catch the unlucky victims at the stomach or the heart. But I'm very tall for a Cambodian. So they hit me at my legs. I was severely wounded, but I was not killed. So I pulled myself out of that hole and I began to limp along until I got to Thailand. In Thailand, I was uh, jailed for illegal entry. Later on, the Thais realized that I was an innocent refugee and he, they brought me to a refugee camp. This is how I look on the right when I arrived in the refugee camp. I was sick and exhausted. And I was living with a camp the size of a, half the size of a soccer field, of a football field. It was hot, humid, filthy, many refugees suffered severe mental depression because they sat around all day feeling sorry about the past and worrying about the future. I thought I would do something to help them out, so I organized English classes. That's one of my classes. It was a win-win proposal because many of them were going to go to an English-speaking country. They were able to get some basic English, and they were able to get their minds of the sorrows and the worries. On June 4th, 1976, one month before the bicentennial, I arrived in Wallingford, Connecticut, with my mother's scarf, an empty rice bag, and two dollars. I was sick and tired and exhausted, but I was full of hope. I was full of hope. I was determined to make a new life. I wanted to adapt to America so that America would adopt me. In French, it sounds even better. Salapte et se fait adopter. Adapt, be adopted. So I did everything that came my way to the best of my ability. I picked apples in Connecticut. I ate a lot of apples, enough to last for a lifetime. And I went to work for an ice cream store. I was to be trained to be the manager, but I must learn how to cook hamburgers, to scoop ice cream, wash dishes. I never seen a hamburger in my life. Suddenly I was hearing rare, medium rare. I was holding the lettuce and the trainer said, hold the lettuce. It took me a while to understand she didn't want me to put the lettuce on the hamburger. It was so difficult. So next stop, New York, New York. I arrived in New York in January 1977. It was a cold winter day. I stood there at the street corner in Manhattan. I saw all these uh, yellow checkers caps coming down, signs on the back, drivers wanted. So I called and they asked me to go to take a test. All about directions. How do you get from the Waldorf Astoria to Yankee Stadium? I had no idea where these places were, much less how to get from one to another. So I just checked the boxes. When I finished, I came to the examiner and gave him the sheet. He looked at the boxes, he frowned. He looked at me from head to toe. He shook his head, he sighed, he said, you pass. 
So I became a taxi driver. In 1977, you did not need to know where you were going <laughs> to be a taxi driver. You needed a strong horn and good brakes. And I was amazed that New Yorkers, they could communicate in sign language. Sometimes with just one finger. <laughs> I just uh, continued to do everything. I got a scholarship to go to Colombia to do a Master of International Affairs. And, uh, and then somehow my wife, Martha, and I were introduced to the Reagans in the 80s. And I was invited to a number of functions at the White House. But this one on the right was on July 13, 1988. That was the first time I met both President Reagan and Vice President Bush. At that time, I already uh, volunteered for the Bush campaign in New York. When I arrived in 1976, I saw elections on TV and watched the conventions with my host family. And I did not understand what was going on. I saw these people with uh, funny hats, jumping up and down the chair, screaming, yelling, and shouting. And my host family told me that this is a convention. These are delegates. They're going to choose two people, and one of them will be elected as the next president. And they told me, uh, Si Chan, you know, if you want to understand this country, you should get involved. So my chance to get involved was in New York. In fact, we started even earlier in 1987. So when, when I was standing there with the President, Vice President of the United States, I, the thought never crossed my mind that a few months later I would be working for the President at the White House. And thanks to our common friend, uh, Chase Antomaya, he introduced me to his colleagues at the White House, and I got invited to an interview, and I was offered a job. Deputy Assistant to the President for Public Liaison. This is an office that was founded by Eisenhower in the 50s to maintain as the liaison between the American public and the President. We are there to listen to their concerns and relay their concerns to the President. And we are there to explain to these people, the association, the federation, uh, all these big organizations, about the present policies and positions on their particular areas. So we were there at the very interesting time. Because if you remember, the first three years of the Bush administration, the world changed. The Soviet Union fell apart, Eastern Europe became free, the Berlin Wall came down, Germany became united. For somebody like me to be sitting there at the White House only 13 years after my escape from Cambodia was quite overwhelming. In fact, the day I walked in to work at the White House on February 13, 1989 was exactly 13 years from the day I jumped off that truck in northwestern Cambodia. In 2001, George W. Bush uh, sent me to the United Nations uh, as an ambassador. And it's a very interesting place because the UN uh, was founded by us. We, are, we were the co-founder. We have a sort of triple responsibility. We have we were co-founder of the United, States, United Nations. We play host to the UN. New York is the world's largest diplomatic community. And third, we are the largest benefactor to all United Nations humanitarian programs from cradle to coffin, from children to aging, and everything in between the women, HIV, AIDS, uh, health, famine, we are there at the top. They are, doing, they are doing this not to be popular. They are doing this because it's our duty to honor our country. Because we are a compassionate society. Each time I walked in, my colleagues from 191 countries looked at me. 
through me, they saw you. They saw America, her strength, her greatness, her future. They wanted to hear what I had to say. Each time I pronounce on behalf of the President and people of the United States, that was my proudest moment. In 2004, <clears throat> I was asked to go to Cambodia to represent <clears throat> the United States at the coronation of the new king. That was quite another overwhelming experience. Here I was, sitting in the throne hall, representing my country of birth at the coronation of the new king of my country, representing my country of adoption at the coronation of the, the new king of, of the country of my birth. And that's what the starting point of my memoir, our memoir, Golden Bones. As I was sitting there, and I looked around, I saw that I was the only one, only dignitary, if you like, invited from a foreign capital. All the countries were represented by the ambassadors accredited to Cambodia. As I was watching the ritual that date back to the 10th century, that's when my memory flashed back to my childhood. In 2005, uh, Martha and I decided that we would leave the East Coast, uh, leave government service, and we returned to God's country. We were flying to Houston, but we forgot to get off the plane, so we ended up in San Antonio. But we had another trip to Cambodia. It was January 2006. We were invited to attend the dedication of the new post-9-11 embassy. This is uh, with top security features, but yet very fitting to the local landscape. This embassy was built by a Texas company that built also the one in Beijing. It was built by Zachary in our hometown of San Antonio. The following morning, I took Martha to meet the new king, right there on the right. And it has been an honor for us to work for two presidents, both named Bush, and both are Texan. We produce our memoir, Golden Bones, which if you look at the front cover, it's attempt to, to ask a question, who, what, when, where, and why, who is it? Si Chan Si, what, what is he doing? He's praying. Where at Angkor Wat? Many of you have been there. This is the world's largest religious monument. And why was this picture was cho chosen among hundreds? Because to us, this symbolizes what is important in life. What is important in life that what George H. W. Bush always said, it's faith, family, and friends. Everything is in there. We added freedom, faith, family, friends, and freedom. I spoke at the uh, George Bush Library and College Station, uh, Texas a and at one point, and one person in the audience was the mayor of Indaituba, which is a town about two hours north of Sao Paulo. When he heard my story, our story, he went back to Brazil and he decided to have the book translated into Portuguese. He said, this must be shared with Brazilians. So we were invited to Sao Paulo to launch the Portuguese edition or the Brazilian edition. And the Brazilians, they know how to throw a party. They gave us all kinds of award, including the one I'm holding which made me the first non-Brazilian to be the recipient. The following year, uh, the Khmer edition, the Cambodian language, came out. A number of people traveled from far away to attend the launch, including the Foreign Minister of Colombia, Maria Angela Holguin. 
She was my counterpart at the UN. She was Ambassador of Colombia and I was a US ambassador. And she uh, always dreamed, dreamed of going to Angkor, Angkor Wat. So I told her that if the stars and the moon align themselves, we would be there together. That year we were invited to speak at a conference and I took her to Angkor and she just did not believe what she saw. When she went back to Colombia, she had the book translated into Spanish. So the Colombians rivaled the Brazilians in throwing a party. We were at a university, we were at the Diplomatic uh, Academy of uh, Colombia, and then from there we went to Spain, somehow the mother country. This University of Cantabria in Santander, North Spain, they organized a conference entitled a Sueño Americano in Primera Persona, the American Dream in First Person. So that's how we titled this presentation. So we have Golden Bones in a few languages now. The Thai language was the one that just came out last month. And we have enjoyed interacting with young people because we strongly believe that these are the future of our country or of any country. The Air Force Academy, the Civil Air Patrol, the Debt Program, and the City Year, which is a program for young people up to 21 to spend one year of their lives helping underperforming students. And we always leave them with this message. Be well, be wise, be worthy. Be flexible and able to adapt to difficult circumstances. Follow your passion. When you do well, don't forget to do good. In the meantime, we produce a book of poetry called Golden Words. I hope you approve of my author's photo. We have another one for those of you who have been to Angkor. This one might be of interest to you called Golden Tower. I went to Angkor Wat the first time in 1959 with my mother. Uh, she rewarded me for having passed the primary education exam. So for Cambodians, Angkor was like a pilgrimage. They say when you see an Angkor, you, when you die, you go to heaven. So I spent a few years taking pictures of Angkor Wat because last year was the 900th anniversary of the coronation of the king who, who built Angkor Wat, Suryaman II. And the pictures that you see in that book are those that I would remember from the 50s and 60s. Very well preserved, very serene, very tranquil, very peaceful. And the other one is called Golden Niner. In Asian societies, a person is one year old when at birth. So George H. W. Bush turned 90 years old on June 12th last year. So I produced this book in his honor with all the socks, crazy socks that I've been wearing around the world, including this one right here. 41. I got it from the library the other day. So this this is a time travel memories for sockies. Sockies go from the 21st century all the way to the 7th century. And the last one was Golden State. This is my first work of fiction. It's uh, in a way a faction, a fiction based on facts. It's a story of uh, two people who have met many, many years ago and then re connected. One was a French diplomat and the other one was a Texan. It started when the new president was sworn in. There was immediate tension between Capitol Hill and the White House. But this president was really involved in a lot of problems from the beginning. So you have France, China and Russia that play a key role in this story. And you have this fictitious country called Litador, which is represented here by the full moon seen rarely through the opening of the jungle canopy. 
and then you have a few other countries involved. But it was France that really worked very hard to protect its former colony, this country. This diplomat, she worked in this country in Africa, and then she went to Bhutan, and from Mongolia, from there she went to Mongolia, and then she ended up in Cambodia. And she left the foreign service after Cambodia. She has a twin sister in Colombia, but this is a Texan. He was connected to that French diplomat. They met in this country in Africa, Alethador, and he was the one who helped solve the problem to diffuse the tension between France, the United States, China, and Russia. The twin sister is in Colombia, and she is, of course, half French, half Colombian. She worked for a Brazilian company. But another key person is a very successful private equity person in New York. He wanted to take control of the mines that were found in Letador, and he had to fight against the Russian and the Chinese. So we have this story. Money, power, and love. Which one will triumph? That is in Golden State. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Where can I buy the uh, Cambodian books that's translated? Um, I would like to buy some for my family. Uh, the Cambodian book? The one that's written in Cambodia. Um, um, me, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have copies here. But if you have relatives in Cambodia, ask them to, to go to Monument Books or any of the big bookstores that carry uh, the Khmer version. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's actually, uh, I should mention that Golden Bones is number one on the required reading list in the kingdom. They put a list together and Golden Bones uh, uh, is uh, number one. Also, the Khmer version has been given away to students uh, as prizes. The, uh, at the end of the uh, school year. How did you meet your wife? <laughs> we met in chapter 13. <laughs> we met uh, through a friend uh, in New York. Uh, Martha was moving from Bangkok. She was working for the United Nations in Bangkok. And I was moving from Connecticut. Uh, so this friend wrote to us, those days we send letters by mail, so he wrote to us separately uh, as, asking us to uh, get in touch. So on September 15, 1977, I came at the invitation of Martha with a bouquet of flowers, and the rest is history. Sorry? You didn't have to go to Pampa to meet her then? Uh, no, in fact, I was taken uh, later on to, introduce, to be introduced to the family, and we were married in Pampa. We were married on Christmas Eve, 1983. Pampa was one of the coldest spots in the country. It was seven degrees below, 12 inches of snow on the ground, and the wind was blowing 20 miles an hour. And everybody in the church had a uh, coat, uh, uh, all, all the, even though the church was at the heat uh, in full blast, but Martha was saying that if I could get through this, I, would be, I must be serious. There's a question right here in front, yeah. and Bonner has a question but, too. But I have a microphone, I guess I'll ask the question. Do, do you, uh, did the Viet Cong uh, damage, destroy any of the Angkor Wat or the other uh, major temples and world heritage sites in Cambodia. Yeah, there was some, uh, there was some uh, trace of uh, mortar shells on Angkor. If you, if you ask the guy, they will show, show you. I think it's in the, uh, I think the Southern Gallery 
in the Southern Gallery, there were some trace of uh, mortar shells. But I tried to get in there in May 1975 during my escape when I was uh, riding my bike. I uh, asked the Khmer Rouge uh, if I could get in to see the temple, even though after I gave them some tobacco as a, as a bride, they said no because uh, the female soldiers were living there, but it wasn't true. I think they were using it as a, a storage of ammunition, storage or something. Yeah. Did you see your mother again? Uh, who asked the question? Okay, right there. Were you able to no, see No, unfortunately not. I, uh, a few years later, when I was uh, at Columbia University in 1980, uh, early 1980, I got a letter from a childhood friend who told me that uh, he returned to the village, our village, uh, and he was told that everybody was killed. My mother, my sister, my brother, their children, 15 of, of them were killed. Uh, in, if you go to my website, cchancy.com, there is an Albert piece in the New York Times that I wrote uh, to commemorate the uh, April takeover of the Khmer Rouge. The title is Last Breakfast in Cambodia. In that article, I told a story about the chaotic uh, scene at the end of the war in Cambodia in April 1975. And 16 of us left Phnom Penh together, and I am the only survivor. Bonner has a question. Before Bonner asks uh, the question, I, I want to congratulate the society for found her, for having found her. And I think you and the Bonner and the society are really a perfect match. We are very proud of you. Thank you, sir. Um, just so you know, Ambassador Steve is the only one who can pronounce my name Accurately. Um, it's technically Bona, like he said, but I've given up and it's officially Bona. So you're, you're welcome to call me either one. Um, first and foremost, it's an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you so much for gracing um, your presence at our facility. You describe a life and experiences that most of us can't even fathom or relate to because it's just so different. Um, what helped sustain you in regards to your journey during your escape that kept you from giving up. I know you mentioned the quote of your mom, never giving up, but was there, um, was it for freedom? Was it for family? What was it that kept you moving forward? Well, of course, my mother was uh, the really tower strength uh, behind my survival. In, uh, in Cambodia, I, I just wanted to survive. I just want to survive and want to escape. But each time, there, there were times when I was really at the end of the rope, so to speak. But then I heard, I heard my mother's voice, no matter what happens, never give up hope. And I mentioned uh, that a few times uh, through our golden bones. So uh, I said I would do it for my mother. I, I will. That's why I, I raised my hand, you know, when they were looking for a cane operator. I didn't know anything about crane, but I knew that the job would take me closer to Thailand. And that would increase my chance to escape. So somehow, all along, her voice continued to resonate in my ear. So when I survived, I escaped, and when I came to the United States, uh, it's, it's now... I was in this wonderful country, you know, the, the freedom, democracy, and so on and so on. But I wanted not just to survive, I wanted to succeed also. And that, again, it was my mother's voice who, who uh, always continued to resonate. And when I met a Texan and my wife, uh, Texans are really wonderful people. So that added another incentive for me to move further onward and upward. So it's, uh, I, I learned everything uh, from somebody else. Just like when I was in Cambodia, the fishermen told me, be careful, stay on the road. Stay on the road, which road? The road to freedom. And then the army sergeant, when he saw me walking across the minefield and I wasn't blown off, he said, be careful, stay on the road. Don't get off the road. And then the truck driver, when he was uh, trying to convince the Khmer Rouge that I wasn't into person, he came back to me. 
He said, be careful, stay on the road. Stay on the road. So that's, that's what. And then the other day I was in Virginia. A fourth grader asked me, how would you describe your life in one word? I never thought of describing my life in one word. So I, I struggled for a few seconds before I came up with the word hopeful. And then she said, by the way, my name is Hope. So we became, we became pen pal. The, the last week when I went to Washington, Martha and I went to Washington, uh, I saw her in Virginia. Yeah. Ambassador Sif, thank you so much for your uh, story. Your journey is one of destiny realized, it seems, and uh, quite inspiring for us all. Uh, if I may turn to more contemporary affairs, uh, with all this talk about the Asian pivot and rebalancing towards Asia, having spent time at the UN, uh, perhaps you can share some of your views on whether or not the UN today truly reflects a balanced Asia or a balanced world, uh, in particular the UN Security Council and maybe just some of your observations uh, in that area. Thank you. But, uh, first, I, I want to say that George H.W. Bush was the first person who uh, used, the word, uh, used the terms that America is a Pacific nation. We were founded by people who came from Europe. Our ancestors came from Europe. But the future, the future is in Asia. Uh, and he used that term uh, for the first time in all the presidential uh, chronicles that America is a Pacific nation. We have fought two wars, uh, three, uh, if you counted the last one. Uh, we lost a lot of people, including George Bush himself, who was shut down uh, over the Pacific. So we have a strong interest in keeping that image, <laughs> in a way. Uh, but we have a lot of allies in, in Asia, starting with Japan, Korea, all the way down the Philippines, and uh, uh, and, and Thailand, uh, those are military allies, and then we have e economic allies also. And we have democratic allies like Indonesia and, uh, and, uh, and India. So we, I, uh, not because I was born in Asia, but because I see it that way from the time I was with George H. Bush, but we are a Pacific nation, and we, knew, we need to present that, that image. United Nations uh, was founded in 1945 by the five powers the victors of World War II. So you're going to have the Security Council uh, with the five permanent members. I don't think anybody wants to give up their, their right to veto. We may want to expand, but I don't think they want to give up the veto power. It's a very difficult uh, to get anything done uh, without consensus. And you can see the issue of Syria. The Chinese and the Russians uh, continue to veto. That's why we couldn't get anything done. But on the humanitarian area, we are proud to, to, to be there at the top. I mean, George W. Bush was the only one who got $15 billion to help women and children in Africa. He got $15 billion for HIV AIDS. And nobody talked about that, uh, unfortunately. He was the first president to bring the human trafficking issue to the United Nations. He was, I was there in the room when he said there are almost a million people who have been bought and sold. As, uh, some of them are as young as 12 and 13 years old, and they lost their future, and we lost our humanity. And we see deadlines sent a team to Cambodia to do a program on sex, sex sla slavery. It's called Children for Sale, and that's a very powerful story. And I was able to show that film a few times at the United Nations. I invited even the guy, the guy who, who was the correspondent. Because Cambodia is what we call a triple danger. It's an original country, a transit country, and a destination country. And when you go there and uh, you see all these young children, totally innocent, were forced into so clear you really lost uh, a lot of uh, belief in the humanity. And uh, so we have done a lot of good things, a lot of good things, and we are proud to be, uh, to be Americans. We are doing this not to be popular, we, we are doing this because it's right. 
just like George H. W. Bush when he shaved his head uh, to show solidarity with a two-year-old kid who uh, who was uh, trying to survive uh, leukemia. People ask him, "What? Why are you doing this?" Because it's right. It's right. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chan. Um, I just want to ask you a psychological question because um, my father was involved with the Vietnam War. He fought for the South and they put him to the uh, concentration camp afterward for seven years. And I know you mentioned you are put into prison as well. And also you mentioned there's a lot of psychological uh, suppression. And um, my question is, because a lot of time people, when they're in that kind of uh, environment, they become depressed, they become suicidal, and some of them even commit suicide. How do you overcome um, the challenge in that environment and then escape and then at the same time um, able to come from the, the mindset of survival into a mindset of living? How do you, how do you transform that mindset? I, uh, I was exposed to that situation when I was in a refugee camp when I, uh, as you saw one of my slides, uh, when I saw so many people who were suffering severe mental depression because they didn't have anything to do. They sat around in a camp uh, feeling sorry about the past and worrying about the future. So I occupied their minds. Uh, uh, in a way, when you get yourself busy, you don't have time to worry about anything else. You just keep on doing things. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are times that you feel down, but uh, the best way is to get up again. Get up and get up and get up. Uh, I, uh, I, I am very thankful that I have my mother's wisdom with me and that I, when, I, when my wife, she, she has been a tower strength to me too, a source of inspiration. So uh, in a way, just keep on, keep on doing things that you feel is right. Follow your, follow your passion. And when you do well, don't forget to do good. Well, we've, we've reached the bewitching hour, and so on behalf of us all, Ambassador Sue, this has been a very special evening, very inspirational, uh, and I think we can say this, you, uh, you make us proud to be a fellow American, and that's what makes this country great. Uh, I, a little side note, I've represented Thailand, so I'm always proud to hear when someone says that they, they had to escape and they were, for all the bad conditions, Thailand's done a great job in receiving refugees. We had another speaker talking from North Korea and they're receiving North Korean refugees right now and through China. But we have a token of um, our appreciation, a small token. Here it is. Uh, I want to remind everyone, the book is still for sale. Golden Bones, Golden State. Do you have another golden book in, uh, in you? Uh, in the making. It's in the making. I, I sort of guess that. What What will the title be? I mean, what was the subject? It's uh, it's uh, it's to be it's to be disclosed. To be disclosed. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank we, you. we hope to see you back in the future. Thank you.